I guess, uh, Tommy. Uh, Tommy Eversfield's the name. A chief engineer at the, uh, the college here. That's me. Well, it, it was back in 1890, um, St. Valentine's Eve, that it all started. Uh, you, the, the young gentlemen of the college were to have a, a grand affair that evening with fancy music and singing and oh, all manner of fine things to show for their studies. A uh, uh, conversazione was what they called it. Yeah, well, sir, about uh, seven o'clock, I went off looking for uh, two of my lads, Pride and Goodwin, the name, and uh, told them to carry the coal oil lamps from the cellar where they was kept up to the uh, goings-on in the east chamber. Well, those two roused themselves and uh, they started up with their lamps. And next thing I know, back they come, running as if the devil himself were after them. Fire, Tommy, they was yelling. And sure as you might say, Jack Robinson, oh, they'd gone and dropped the lamps, the lot of them, and kerosene everywhere, too. Well, sir, the whole shooting works just went right up in their faces. And come eight o'clock, oh, we had a real hell fire on our hands. College all to the east and the south was roaring like a storm. Oh, I don't mind telling you, it was a, a terrifying sight. Uh, by morning, it was all over. And there we stood, shivering in the cold. Me and, and the folks from all around, just looking on, helpless like. Oh, it, it was like a nightmare that night, was it? Much of University College lay in smoking ruin. The University Library had vanished overnight. Of the entire collection of about 30,000 volumes, only 769 books on loan at the time, and a few dozen charred remnants survived the blaze. Yet, ironically enough, the Great Fire of 1890 proved to be a turning point in the history of the University of Toronto's library system. The forerunner of the university and the first site for what was to become the university's first book collection was King's College. Though the college was chartered by George IV in 1827, teaching did not begin until 1843, when all of 26 pioneer undergraduates sought enlightenment at the college's temporary location in the old Parliament building on Front Street. 1849. Amidst a storm of controversy, King's College was secularized and became the University of Toronto. Undaunted, Bishop Strawn, founder and mentor, set off with a new charter and founded Trinity College, where the old bonds with the Church of England could be reaffirmed. And with him went much of the original book collection from King's College. The burden of library reorganization for the fledgling university fell to the Reverend John W. Small in 1852 and to his successor, the Reverend Alexander Lorimer, librarian from 1854 to 1869. Under the part-time direction of Mr. Lorimer, the library was to change location no less than three times. First, it moved from Front Street to the new King's College building on Queen's Park. Then in 1856, it moved to Moss Hall and the King's College building, to the amusement of many, was converted into a mental hospital. By 1853, Colonel F.W. Cumberland's imposing design for University College was beginning to take form. Painstaking and slow though the construction methods may appear, the spires and turrets were topped off six years later. Again, the library had found a new home. Spacious and modern by the standards of the day, the university's new library was to be found in the East Hall of the majestic Main Wing. Over the next 21 years, the university book collection grew steadily under the supervision of John E. Thompson, a graduate of King's College, and then under W. H. Vandersmissen, professor of German. And then February 1890 and the Great Fire. Classes were hurriedly rescheduled after an interruption of only two days and repairs to University College were begun at once. James Bredner, a recent graduate of the University, was immediately appointed acting librarian. But the man of the hour was Walter Barwick, an energetic Toronto lawyer 
and chairman of the Senate Library Committee. In 16 months, Barwick and his Library Restoration Committee collected no less than $40,000, 31,000 volumes, and 5,000 pamphlets. Contributions arrived not only from prestigious figures of the age, but also from cities, states, societies, and universities the world over. Barwick's energy and enthusiasm were unfailing. In 1891, the university's registrar, Mr. H. H. Langton, was appointed the university's first full-time librarian. It was an age of change, and Langton was quick to move with the times. A card catalog was adopted, and a unique classification system, which was used until 1959, was devised in short order. But the need for a separate library building was critical. After the fire, the library had been set up in temporary quarters in the biology building and then the School of Practical Science. The decision was made. A separate library was to be built at the east end of the university lawn, and A. B. Dick, the university architect, proceeded with the design. October 1892, the new university library was officially opened. It was magnificent. At a cost of $65,000, the building featured steam heat and that most modern of conveniences, electric light, fireproof stacking for more than 120,000 volumes, a large reading room with seating for 200, plus seven seminar rooms. And the staff also had grown to one full-time librarian, four assistants, and a porter. And that was only the beginning. In its new location, the library collection grew quickly, grew so fast, in fact, that by 1909, the stack rooms were full to overflowing. A new wing was built, pushing the total stack capacity up to 420,000 volumes, a staggering figure for those days. The university press and a bookstore were housed in the library too. 1914 and the shot that was heard around the world. During the war years, cramped quarters were the order of the day. But somehow room was found in the library for Red Cross workers and hospital supply volunteers. And then the headlines proclaimed peace, and the library set about trying to obtain missing journals which had not been received during the war. 1923. After 31 years of service, Mr. Langton retired as chief librarian and was succeeded by Stuart Wallace. In that year, Mr. Wallace reported an urgent requirement of the library in the near future will be additional stack room. It is estimated that within two years the existing stack room will be filled and in this event an extension to the university library building will be necessary. An expansion plan was drafted in 1929 but the Great Depression began and funds were simply non-existent. In fact it was not until 1954 the year of Dr. Wallace's retirement that a new extension was opened to the north of the old building. Dr. Sigmund Samuel had contributed generously towards the cost of this new extension, and it was accordingly named in his honor. Even as it opened in 1954, Mr. R. H. Blackburn, the present university librarian, who succeeded Dr. Wallace, warned that the additional space would again be filled in only six years. It was the perennial problem of keeping pace with courses of study and of developing research collections. In 1959, the Advisory Committee for Future Library Facilities, chaired by Dean McLaughlin, recommended that sweeping changes be made throughout the university library system, and one by one, its recommendations were adopted. But the culmination of the committee's works came in November 1968, with the letting of the construction contract for what we now call the John P. Robarts Research Library named for the Premier of Ontario at the time the plans were approved. The story of the University of Toronto's library system spans almost a century and a half, from borrowed space in the old Parliament building to its ultra-modern headquarters in the Robarts Library, ready to meet the future.